Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's SANS webcast. No single definition of a SOC, part one of the SANS 2018 SOC survey results webcast. Sponsored by Authentic8, Awake, Cyberbit, DF Labs, ExtraHop, and Logarithm. My name is Carol Auth of the SANS Institute. Today's featured speakers are Chris Brasjunas of Logarithm, Christopher Crowley, SANS Principal Instructor, Barbara Kay of ExtraHop, John Clausen of Authentic8, and John Pescatori, SANS Director of Emerging Security Trends, who will be moderating this webcast. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Chris Crowley. Thank you very much, Carol. I'm uh, happy to be here and I want to uh, you know, talk through some of the materials and what we collected through the survey. This is um, an interesting survey and there will be another webcast on Thursday um, with some more key points from it. But really, I would encourage everybody to also read the survey. I think that there's some great data in there. I think that it helps you to understand the position of where you are relative to other organizations and relative to where you would like to see your own organization get to. So I'll talk a little bit about demographics and then some staffing components. A little bit about outsourcing, the tools in use and how people arrange the SOC and whether they're distributed or centralized. A little bit about whether there is a NOC or if there is, what there is a relationship between that NOC and the SOC and some ideas about how people are trying to work on actually structuring their SOC. So the cybersecurity sector was the most represented. It's no surprise. Um, one of the problems that I find with surveys is that it becomes a bit of an echo chamber. We reach the same people. Um, that we speak to people who are most like us. And so a uh, decent number of the people were in cybersecurity. This represents MSSPs. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that tomorrow. I'm sorry, on Thursday about the MSSP component. Um, banking has a you know, pretty established presence in security. They are um, on the front line of fraud activity. They're being attacked, and the uh, the numbers, depending upon where you look, are you know usually rated at billions with a B, uh, an annual loss through uh, cyber fraud and other uh, attacks against uh, finance. Um, governments have typically been also uh, heavily involved in developing security operations centers, and it's no surprise that they were uh, present in relatively large numbers. Um, the people who actually were um, responding. We're more in the analyst, administrator, uh, manager, and director role. Um, the people who were uh, responding were people who tend to be more on the technical, technical SME, or um, near managers. So it's interesting to note that there's a relatively small number of CISOs, CSOs, um, and uh, sort of general uh, IT directors. This, again, from a survey perspective, skews the um, the concept of what the data is. Now, it's still valuable data. I think that it's important to realize, though, where these answers are coming from, the people that are actually answering for us. The uh, representation of companies coming out of uh, US, North America, and Europe is about 75%. Um, in my anecdotal experience, that is representative of the uh, people who are actually running SOX, but I think that we have a population definition concern um, with where security operations centers actually are in the world. Um, I'm trying very hard to identify a source to be able to actually collect information 
um, to be able to say with some reasonable degree of precision how many socks there are in the world. Um, I haven't been able to identify that. I have some speculation on what that might be. But again, if we're doing a survey, one of the things that we really want to focus on is how big is the population that we're surveying so we can get an assessment of whether our survey is representative of that uh, population or not. Um, so I'm depicting what's here, but I'm also identifying the potential for some um, skew in terms of what our answers look like versus the reality in the world. In addition to that, we have people operating their uh, their socks in various regions, uh, North America, broken out between the uh, United States and Canada, uh, representing a, a substantial portion of activity um, where people are actually uh, running their uh, their systems for their socks. Europe and Asia, um, no surprise that they're uh, that they're represented. Um, and again, this is just getting us into a position so we get an understanding of who it is that we're uh, that we're dealing with. And then in terms of the size of the organizations, and this question when we asked it, we we sort of let people um, count however they wanted to count, whether this was employees or endpoint nodes. Um, you know, because you might have a massive network that you're protecting with your SOC. But then again, you might also have a massive number of customers where, you know, you're, uh, you have a, a very large internet presence or you're a financial institution that doesn't have hundreds of thousands of endpoint nodes, but it does have hundreds of thousands of customers. Um, so without being overly constraining, we asked people to, to give us an idea of what, how big they were, right? And then um, some of this, I'll show a correlation uh, later um, in terms of, the number of full-time equivalents for that particular SOC, and then the number of, uh, um, you know, the size of the organization. So getting into the staffing component, um, what is the size of the SOC is an interesting aspect. This is a very common concern for people is how many people do I need in order to effectively run my SOC? So just looking at the numbers, most people are in the um, 2 to 25 range. Overwhelming um, you know, portion of the respondents are in that range. Um, and you know, if you break it down further, in the 2 to 5 range was the, uh, was the, the largest count of respondents. Uh, this is interesting in as much as many people are trying to run security operations on a um, you know, with a very small number of people. And this will force that small number of people to um, have to do a lot of different things. And when you have an individual who has to do a lot of different things, they do have the benefit of, uh, you know, an overview understanding, but then you start to lose specialization and capability. So this is just a, uh, a challenge for any SOC manager is what is the right number of people? How can I show this to my, uh, to my management? How can I prove to them that this is, the, uh, this is the correct number for us to do all the things that we need to do? Um, and so another part of this is that FTE count is, um, is relevant to the SOC overall. But there's a challenge in this space in determining how many people do I need just to keep the proverbial lights on within the SOC. There's a lot of technology that goes into running the SOC and there's a specialization associated with that. So we asked the question, how many infrastructure um, people do you have in your um, organization? And the number on that chart, just to make sure you understand, is just a raw count and is not correlated to the uh, number of the sizes of the SOCs overall. We looked back to last year's survey and got a sense of how many uh, people uh, were in the SOC last year versus how many people um, are in the SOC this year. And this is not tracked to individual respondents, but across the population, it's about the same. You know, if you, if you look at these numbers, um, it's roughly the same of, uh, of what we have. And, you know, I certainly wouldn't want to, uh, wouldn't want to 
you know, say, look, there's not, there's, you know, shrinkage or growth there because it's, it's mixed. And so overall, um, this question of how many people do I need? Um, I've been talking about not having an equation. And this is uh, one equation that I've now seen that I think is worth um, chewing on a little bit. And I think that this is a, a good rough draft. And this comes from Carson Zimmerman's keynote at the SOC Summit that just occurred in New Orleans a couple of weeks ago. Um, if you're not familiar with Carson Zimmerman, uh, while he was at MITRE, uh, he wrote a book called The um, Top 10 Strategies of World-Class Cybersecurity Operations Centers. And if you haven't read that book, um, it's available for a free PDF download. So if you do a search for MITRE, Zimmerman, SOC, and top 10 strategies should probably arrive at the link as the first one. So this equation, the idea of how many compute environments you're actually dealing with, um, times the um, number of alerts to process per shift. How do you know that? Well, oftentimes you need to be running one in order to be able to calculate this. You can speculate it based on, um, you know, types of uh, types of networks, but Again, no, no equation is perfect. The uh, number of minutes it would take to process an alert for an analyst. Some constant, because um, you know, most equations need a constant to do some correction to be able to put the uh, range into the correct range from the different uh, components of the equation. And then the number of minutes available um, per FTE per year. Um, and so that is how much work time they have to actually do analysis minus the other things that they need to do, training and handoffs and answering emails related to uh, you know where everybody's going for lunch and whatever other things you're subtracting out of their uh, their day with other non-task related um, attention so this is a start I'm actually uh, looking forward to working with Carson on this and I think that uh, you can see something in the future from him and I related to taking this equation maybe modifying it slightly um, and then going and doing some assessment of this relative to what we see in the wild and see how people are uh, doing and see if this equation is actually uh, worthwhile or not. We asked the question about outsourcing. What are you outsourcing? And um, the thing here that we have in this chart, and I'll get to an overall, but I wanted to blow this up so you could actually see it. Um, the thing here that we have in this chart is whether they're doing both internal and external, only internal or only, ex only external. So. Um, Frequently outsourced was uh, incident response, monitoring, um, architecture and engineering, administration. These are some of the uh, some of the, the top ones um, that were there. If you're uh, confused by the ranking of this, this is ranked on a uh, sum uh, wise basis. Um, so as we go through, um, we see that um, we have sort of this uh, you know smaller set of people who are actually doing some of these things like. Um, purple teaming, as an example, um, not a lot of people are doing purple teaming. And if you're not familiar with the term, this is the idea of um, having an attack, um, you know, pen test, but more of a sustained pen test that's established to be able to help to train um, the blue team. So the red team is the pen testers and the blue team is the defenders. And this purple teaming is an exercise that's established that lets the attackers um, help to train the defenders. And again, so just overall, um, not a lot of people are doing it. Um, and you know, as we can we can play around with the numbers and look at the percentages relative to internal versus uh, both versus external. So um, I have some some additional sort of charts that are relative to this, but it gives you an idea of what people are uh, are outsourcing um, in the uh, in the space. Reason why I think this is useful is you can take a look and say, hey, have we decided to outsource this? If so, um, what is our strategy overall related to outsourcing? And then specifically for these different uh, different capabilities, does it make more sense for me to have this capability internally versus externally? You will, of course, have unique characteristics of your organization that might compel you to uh, you know, go against the trends of what people are actually doing and depicted here. But at the same time, this gives you a, a concept of what are my, uh, you know, what are my competitors and peers doing um, in terms of outsourcing. Um, so this is just something that um, I wanted to mention a few comments where a lot of people talked about vulnerability management 
um, specifically as an outsourced capability that wasn't, in their opinion, captured in the selections that were there. Um, this uh, tools and technology, and um, if you're not seeing the tool or technology that you're interested in the chart, um, that's probably because of the way the, uh, the graphic rendered, it's got um, some actually missing if you count the number of bars and you count the number on the left-hand side. So um, apologies for that. This is a, uh, this is um, a graph that talks about what different uh, tools people are interested in. This, I think, is a really important thing for you to look at and say, um, do I have this technology? Um, do I have potentially multiples of this technology? And then are other people facing the same challenges that I have in using this technology? Um, and, and it's interesting, and I'll just, I'll just um, you know, kind of uh, pull this up for a second, but uh, we talked about um, doing prevention versus detection versus both. Um, we also have some aspects of uh, satisfaction related to this in terms of uh, in terms of the survey. I think that this is um, what a lot of people look to in terms of solving problems in their SOC is we need another tool. Um, but again, I will uh, I will assert that I think that all technology is broken in some way, and I think that you should plan to have verification capability off of any given tool. Um, don't blindly, blindly trust them. And your analysts should really be the cornerstone of whether that tool is telling you something that's actually, uh, that's actually um, you know, valid. So I, I had a comment. Um, I think that it's uh, something that is, is really uh, you know, interesting. Uh, a lot of people were talking about the, uh, the ways that they were uh, dealing with things. So you know, they have the next-gen firewalls. Central logging is uh, something that they're having a challenge with because they can't force people to do it. The asset inventory, this is something that a lot of people talk about being frustrated with. And um, you know, for me, the SOC should be an ideal place where we learn about what is actually on our network. And I think that the asset inventory is a collector, but really the processing and the digestion and the uh, assessment as to whether or not we understand what it is that is on our network is really the important part of this. And so when people talk about their asset inventories being complete or having to spend a lot of time manually correlating between an IP address that they see in a, in a SIM and then go find the responsible parties, um, I see that as a, bro a broken process aspect that really needs to be resolved in the long term. Um, architecture of SOCs, we can have a single centralized SOC. Um, you can have the uh, the proverbial uh, follow the sun model where you've got you know your you know Seattle, Dublin, um, and uh, Sydney. You know, for for example, there are lots of different places where um, SOCs end up getting put. Um, you have all sorts of challenges when you start to do distribution, hiring people, handoffs, um, you know, cohesion, following the same processes or specializing processes to region and so on. Um, this is something that, you know, basically most people are just doing a single uh, central SOC. This is the way that most people solve this problem. If they want to have 24 by 7, there are two ways that they ended up solving the problem. One was they shift to an MSP. Uh, the other is they do some sort of a um, uh, schedule that allows people to have 24 by 7 capability. So several people pointed out in their uh, comments that they were using, you know, managed service provider. Maybe they would have um, some sort of cloud model where people could work from wherever they were and they got, uh, they got coverage or on-call support because people were in different time zones. Um, so in terms of the architecture then, um, the SOC might have multiple components where there's a relation among the components that needs to be tracked. But then as we asked about the relationship of the SOC to other parts of the IT organization, we asked the question, what is the relationship between your SOC, your security operation center, and your NOC, your network operation center? And honestly, um, I was not surprised but disappointed by the uh, responses here. That we don't have a NOC is an interesting one. Um, when, I, when I hear people talk about that, I, I imagine a place where security is trying to do good, and when they reach an IT problem versus a security problem, they're struggling to identify the responsible party in order to be able to, uh, to do this. I don't imagine that when people answer we don't have a knock, 
that what they're saying is, in essence, we have a converged NOSC network operations and security center that has you know full complete compatibility, right? I, I'm just not um, I'm not getting the sense that that's what people say when they respond. We don't have a NOSC. Similarly, the idea that you don't have tight coupling and integration with uh, you know federation of data and integration of processes. That's where you want to be. In my opinion, what you want to be is even if you can't um, be directly embedded in one another's uh, you know, operations because of oversight or organizational separation, what you want to have is a close coupling of processes and data so that when one team's needing the other team to do something, that that can be done effectively. I also thought, well, maybe, maybe this is a result of uh, size and maturity, um, and you can spend some time pondering this graph yourself. Um, but based on the uh, the data sets, I, I really didn't see that this was something that I could correlate to uh, to size. Um, the distribution um, pattern seemed maybe not consistent, but um, from which uh, one, a pattern could not be drawn to say, oh, in this range, people have really gotten it figured out. <clears throat> so um, I looked at the industry grouping along this and didn't see that there's a, uh, you know, a real strong correlation between, uh, you know, say banking and finance. We have a lot of representation with where they were saying, oh, yeah, we've got that figured out with our knock and our sock. Just didn't see that either. Um, I also wondered about the uh, idea of the CIRT, C-I-R-T, and the SOC, and whether over time these have become the same term or whether organizations are approaching this as a totally different thing. Um, if you want to see some of my thoughts on what a SOC is, uh, there are other webcasts out there that you can go find and, uh, and review. But essentially, in, in my model, the, the one that I espouse, I put incident response under SOC. So the question was, is this what organizations do? Um, and it seemed that um, there are only a small number of organizations that are maintaining a CERT, some sort of incident response team, as separate from a SOC. Um, and when people are doing that, they have, uh, they have, uh, you know, some internal capability and then some external outsource capability for this. Um, so it's about half where people are uh, are doing it as the integration and then doing it in some sort of an ad hoc or phase shift strategy where your SOC transforms into you know taking some resources and being delegated out to incident response should the need arise is a uh, is the next most common strategy that's actually um, there. So I've uh, managed to get through a large number of uh, slides in a relatively uh, fast period of time. So um, I'm going to go ahead and invite John to, uh, to go ahead and speak. Thank you, John. Uh, greetings. My name is John Clausen from Authenticate. By far, the number one attack vector for cyber exploits is the browser. You can't block the whole internet, and you can't control every little thing your users do. So by using a browser that is in the cloud and off your systems, off your devices, your users can surf the web freely, and no matter what happens, your system data remains untouched. Next slide, please. Survey says teams are struggling with tools, efficiency, and practices. Given that every research project starts with the browser and everyone agrees that the browser has inherent security issues, let's leverage the cloud browser for positive impact on security operations teams. Next slide. Customers tell us Silo makes their people more productive. Silo gives them an easy button. In their experience, Silo is faster to start and dispose of sessions than their current solutions. With a fresh new browser built for every session, an automatic disposal at session N, there's no manual cleanup. It's like never having to think to put on a pair of surgical gloves every time you operate, never having to dispose of the medical waste once you're done. Next. Silo allows full interaction with offending sites, not just screenshot and run. What if criminals know to present a benign website state when the investigators are visiting? 
use Silo's local egress network for local access to foreign websites to solve that challenge. Find yourself on a foreign website but don't speak the language? Postfetch language translation solves the problem without tipping off the bad guys. Need to capture a phishing kit? Silo Secure Storage is at your service. Next. Most, if not all, research tools are available as web apps. When tools and tech operate efficiently, it removes a key barrier to efficient workflows. A cloud browser doesn't require a PhD in security to use. Ramping new hires to use feature like attribution levels, customizable fingerprints, configurable egress points, tracking mechanisms, data capture, dark web access, and more doesn't require heroic efforts. Next. Investigators need to have extended web to access. Customers ask, how do we watch our watchers? With Silo, every user action is auditable. Your data is your data, not ours. So your Silo log files can be encrypted with a customer provided key. Next. Why build and maintain your research platform when you can buy? Customers switch to Silo because a secure anonymous auditable browser may be a lot of fun to build, but it's not fun to maintain. Next. The SAS survey tells us security teams are struggling. Customers trust us to make security teams more efficient and effective. Deployment is a SaaS app, no new infrastructure required. Customers tell us Silo is ridiculously easy to use. You're spending more on security each year, yet experience more security incidents. You have an intractable problem. It's time for a profound change. Trust a cloud browser instead of your free local browser. Next. Security researchers need access to code and content that shouldn't be allowed into the organization. They also need to visit places on the web the rest of the employee base shouldn't. Toolbox, a silo add-on, gives research teams a spoofable managed attribution environment for accessing the dark web. Whether visiting a forum or collecting and analyzing data for casework, Silo is the leading research platform for teams across the industry. Next. Silo positively impacts areas that the survey says are critical to providing force multipliers to allow limited staff to identify issues, keep up with vulnerabilities and threats, and prioritize action and response. Next. Effectiveness of SOC NOC integration was rated low in the survey as John highlighted with the same performance and capabilities for all users at all locations, Silo can be your key to overcoming resource shortfalls. A survey respondent shared, in trying to be honest about what we've actually deployed and have process defined for, dot, 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 <laughs> we're still in the early stages. In contrast, today we have government organizations who are using sophisticated silo features, including managed attribution and our global network of egress points. Top law firms are responsible for their client sensitive data and trust silo to protect it. Silo delivers measurable benefits to customers, lots of customers. Thank you and back to John. Great, this is um, Chris Branch Junis here at Logarithm. Why don't you go ahead and flip the next slide? There you and, go, Chris. Um, all right, yeah, one more. Great, so there I am, you can see me in the picture. And I'm Chris Branch Junis, VP of Products, happy to talk to you today and give us our thoughts on what we learned uh, from the survey results that Chris just described. Um, just to give an intro, Logarithm, we're a leading provider of next-gen SEM solutions and we offer end-to-end -end threat lifecycle management to enterprises, and that drives what we believe is high SOC efficiency as well as effectiveness. Let's move to the next slide. So one of the things that Chris talked about was the SOC staffing, and that the relative profile of security operations today has been unchanged, where majority of our our SOCs are less than five, as Chris suggested, and over 60% are less than 10. I actually found that result as logarithm surprising because we know that workloads are increasing in the enterprise today with the perimeter eroding, 
right? Cloud, there's more and more uh, hybrid enterprises coming about the need to be able to monitor and um, from a from a security perspective, IoT devices as well as mobile as well as mobility and the mobile workforce. We know that alarm volumes are are still increasing, even though there is technology out there such as behavioral analytics that drive higher efficiency. Um, and then we also know that SOCs continue to bring in more and more technologies to, specifically around cloud security, so that we can um, be able to manage the hybrid SOC. So let's go to the next slide. So the other interesting um, data point that Chris mentioned was uh, most SOCs are looking to have incident response as part of it, right? Over 50%, and it was 121 out of the survey. And so what does that mean? It, it means that your anal the analysts need to be more and more efficient um, so that we can drive and that so we can drive lower time to detect and respond and remediate and have the analysts be able to monitor and manage and respond to more and more alerts. Um, we also need to be able to manage the SOC effectiveness. So from our perspective, one of the industry trends we are seeing is an increase in tools and capabilities within platforms today that facilitate higher SOC efficiency. And that goes to something called security automation, orchestration response, or SOAR. It is a growing capability of solutions today um, that helps drive that efficiency. Let's go to the next slide. So what is SOAR? SOAR is, SOAR is a set of capabilities that can be um, a single solution that an enterprise can purchase, or it also can be embedded as part of another platform like Ascent. And this is something that Logarithm does embed in their platform today to drive um, highly efficient threat lifecycle management. And with SOAR, we have four sets of capabilities. We have, the man we have the capability to manage the case itself within the platform or interconnect with your third-party ITSM to, to perform that capability. We have automated actions to be able to more easily and readily um, investigate an, an incident by reaching out automatically to a set of security tools or other enterprise infrastructure. That automation also can be leveraged for countermeasures and mitigation actions. Um, SOAR capabilities include ways to gather more business contacts from third-party platforms as well as to measure overall SOC effectiveness. And for logarithm, we see that as mean time to detect, mean time to respond, mean time to triage an incident, and, and mean time to investigate. Looking at all these, helping you understand how, how your uh, SOC is, is um, efficient and how you can make it more effective. So let's go to the next slide. One of the things I, you know, I wanted to share with you is a survey that Logarithm did, and we did this early this year. Help, help. We wanted to understand how interested are our customers in um, automation and orchestration and response capabilities within the SEM and outside the SEM. And what we found was over 63% um, of our customers. Um, have adopted or want to adopt our own case management that is within the logarithm platform. So that's over half, and that's quite a bit. And then if we look at smart, re if we look at automation, which we call smart response, uh, we have 70% who either have adopted or want to adopt, with a third having to adopt. And we see both of these um, percentages increasing rapidly in our customer base. And if we think if we believe that our customer base represents the world, then I think um, that's a good indicator that SOAR capabilities are something that enterprises and security security operation centers are looking to adopt over the next few years. And it's something you may want to consider as part of a solution platform like logarithms. Thanks you. Thank you very much. That's all I have. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Barbara Kay. Can you hear me? Uh-huh. Great. Well, uh, thank you for giving us some time today. The um, surveys that SANS does, I think, are really helpful because they provide that broad brush um, and fresh understanding of what's cooking 
in the uh, cybersecurity space. I pulled out a quote that I really liked from the survey, and I do encourage everyone to read the survey because, you know, today's webcast is just half of the content. Um, but I really like the point they made about, um, Chris and John made about proactive and reactive. And I think we've talked about maturing um, security for many years, certainly I have, and the, um, the combination and the balance is tough to achieve and hard to maintain, right? But um, what we do at ExtraHop, and uh, next slide, is we've tried to tackle some of the problems that we mentioned in the uh, survey. So, for example, how do you integrate and share data and processes more effectively between the Security Operations Center and the Network Operations Center? Historically, um, people have had uh, a variety of network-based tools that have had more and less capability, right? In the case of packets, typically that's something that people use to dig into digital forensics. It happens to be one of the um, products that people think they're pretty satisfied with. But the challenge is that packets tend to be after the fact. And what we find is that many people have their packet systems maintained independently of their other uh, SOC tools. So it's a swivel chair and a delay to go off and retrieve the data. And the data is not integrated in anything else they're doing. So you're stuck in that manual correlation effort, which um, uh, the survey describes. And that, you know, Manual correlation is just, we can't afford that, right? That's part of what's driving for the, some of the SOAR capabilities that Chris just talked about. Um, signatures and flows, right? Historically, binary, you know, uh, rules-based and layer two to layer four. Not bad as a source of information, but if that's how you're driving your process, it's gonna take more time and you're gonna find yourself with a lot more noise to, to distill and a lot more um, data that's partial. Right, you're seeing layer two to four, you're seeing a part of the puzzle. You know someone talked, but you don't know what they said, right? Um, rules, I think I, I would throw in this bucket in terms of um, old ways of dealing with things. So you can add up a few different um, data points and make a decision based on that. But it's still a point in time reference that says this is what happened, um, this is what I know to look for at a point in time. And it isn't as adaptive and proactive as we would want. And that's one reason why you see more and more tools embracing uh, machine learning as a means of being adaptive without needing the, the concrete and timely um, determination of a supervised process of rules creation or even supervised machine learning. So another big category now that we're seeing, in addition to SOAR, as Chris mentioned, uh, we see some of the analysts like Gartner and 451 and EMA embracing a new category of tools called network traffic analytics or network traffic analysis. The idea here is that you're trying to monitor more of the east-west corridor. This gives you visibility into things like assets that might be uh, coming and going in your network. So CIS controls one and two around hardware and software assets, but doing automated discovery in real time of what's happening within your network. And we see a ton of um, dark space is what we call it within that east-west corridor, and especially in the late stage attack activities that might go north-south once an attacker has penetrated, gotten inside, navigated around, and is looking for either additional tools, additional guidance from command and control, or they're actually making the XL. So um, network traffic analytics, gives you a different level, caliber, and speed of operation in terms of time to metrics. Um, so we like that about real time. And in our case, with ExtraHop at least, um, we see it as being very conclusive. The reason being that we are observing the traffic. We're not visible. We can't be turned off the way an agent can be. We can't be spoofed the way a log can be. And we're getting a, a comprehensive stack of data about a transaction. So it's far more conclusive in terms of the conclusions you can draw, the evidence you glean, and what you can do about it. Next slide, please. Thinking about the proactive and reactive perspective, one of the things that's um, especially nice from a network traffic analytics perspective is that a lot of SOCs find themselves, you know, um, depending on your level of, of role, tier one, two, three, hunter, um, or the time 
uh, you may have a little more time to hunt or a little more um, need to go off and investigate things like, you know, those purple team findings, the red and blue team findings. There are lots of things that you can do proactively when you have the time or you have a signal that you want to investigate. And there's also uh, reactive stuff when, you know, everything goes wrong. What do you do and how do you move quickly? And Network traffic analytics gives you a way to um, embrace multiple use cases with a single tool set. And that kind of um, value uh, is really helpful. It also includes the data and processes that you can share with the network operations team. So to Chris Crowley's point about um, sharing the data and processes, we see a ton of interest in having new, uh, network operations folks be empowered to solve security problems, security folks empowered to work more closely with people based on the network signals they're able to hear. Next slide, please. So, um, ExtraHop's product for this space is called RevealX. We see it as enterprise class network traffic analytics. We can scale more than 10 gigabits per second. We are decoding and decrypting. So one of the paper's topics is around TLS decryption. And uh, we didn't go into that today. They'll go cover that tomorrow. But the idea of decrypting out of band so that you can understand and um, look at even TLS 1.3 traffic, that's something that will empower you to do more, to have the visibility you need to both understand what's happening and act on it quickly. The insights come from not just detecting, but characterizing and contextualizing the data against the attack chain and surrounding a given point of light with its related events and relationships so that you can understand what to do. And we provide you know, risk scoring and threat intelligence integration to make that easy and to make it contextual. Again, we're trying to reduce the manual burden of correlation, the swivel chair, the delay. And a lot of people just can't get the data they need when they need it in the cognitive workflow. And so we've really worked to tackle that with a compelling uh, user experience. And then because we can store packets, we go right to the answers you need. So you analyze first and dig into packets if and when you need to. So all of that translates to real value in terms of better time to detection, better time to resolve, and less effort to resolve, which is really you know the, the ongoing drumbeat of the SOC challenge today. So I wanted to close next slide with um, a pointer to uh, a SANS slide that we are, uh, sorry, a SANS webcast that we're co-hosting. Chris Crowley will be doing a return performance next week with us, and we'll be digging into network traffic analytics for the SOC. If you'd care to join us, it's on August 23rd, and there's information um, available on the SANS website as well as extrahop.com. Thank you. Great, so this is Chris Crowley. Um, I do want to uh, thank our speakers. Um, I'm going to thank you for attending. A couple of uh, things to um, follow up. Um, just to mention, there is a second part of the SOC survey that will be happening on Thursday. The link for that is here. Um, the link was also posted into the chat window so that you can uh, copy and paste that easily. Uh, the things that I'll be talking about then are um, SOCs that identify as managed service providers and those that don't, tools and technologies and some more detail. Um, SOC likelihood to address IoT, another uh, non-traditional um, IT components, ideas of data sharing and integration, how people are automating tasks and if they're doing some things manually, and then the uh, challenges that they're facing and trying to do things effectively. Um, so I do want to thank John, um, Chris, and Barbara for taking the time to join us and talking about their uh, respective products and the things that are uh, available to help you to accomplish this, but oftentimes is a uh, monumental task. And at this point, what I'd like to do is turn it over to John Pescator um, to go ahead and um, collect the questions that people have been asking and let him uh, go ahead and manage the panel part of the discussion. Okay, thanks, Chris. We've got a bunch of uh, questions that came in. I'll bundle a few up and throw them at you first, Chris, then I'll cycle through our other panelists. Um, so Chris, the audience doesn't want to let you off quite as easily on your tap dance around. How how big should my sock be? How many people do I need? For 14 people. That's the answer, John. Everybody <laughs> needs exactly 14 people. Yeah. Well, the question is sort of, okay, if, if there's not an exact number or formula, what does it more closely correlate to? Events per second? total nodes, total employees? Is there something that you can say 
the the number you need does essentially correlate or or is most tightly related to um so the factors that i would actually uh identify for them um current maturity if you have a highly mature it organization that will drive your numbers down um the size of the network that you're monitoring, which can also be translated as events per second. Um, but again, that size might be in nodes, it might be in people, and it might be in customers. And then um, complexity of IT. If you have a uh, massive complex um, infrastructure, you'll need to uh, account for that and you'll end up needing to, uh, needing to have more people. Uh, the other part of that that I've seen is uh, industry. Um, in certain industries, the staff that gets hired um, tends to be um, more multi-purpose and generalist and other uh, industries that tend to be a focus on people within specific swim lanes with specific tasks and a lot less um, variation and adaptability and more um, sort of a repeatable action from an individual ana analyst. Um, so. If you just want a single thing, it, the easiest one to look at is organization size, um, because a lot of those things wrap into um, into that. So if you have a very large organization, you know, global organization, um, you will probably get closer to your uh, tens of or hundred size. Um, when I talk about it in Management 517, I talk about it in terms of rough order of magnitude, and I just you know, in terms of what your sock will look like, I talk about the sock of one, the sock of 10, the sock of 100, which is really mostly what we say. And then the last um, size that I actually include is the sock of 1000. And some people challenge me around that being in existence, but I have seen it when you start to count FTEs across um, very large global entities. Um, but you know, if uh, if you know people people are looking at a single thing for correlation, it's definitely um, organization size by by employees or by nodes. Okay, now I'm going to toss you a question of my own here. So I I know I need more people, and I and I got management to agree I can hire some more SOC people. What's the what metrics I I should be collecting so I can then come back a month later, six months later, whatever, and say, look, here's how we got better because I did increase the staff and the and the cost of the SOC, but here's here's how we got better. What are the most critical metrics for just for showing management they get they got good benefit for the money they gave me? Yeah, so the the couple that are out there, um, one is, and this is a kind of a boilerplate one, every, everybody collects it and it should be used as the idea of mean, mean time to detection and that kind of uh, that kind of notion. The other one that's a lot more complicated that gives you a better picture is the idea of um, um, loss prevention. Um, the idea being that if we can move detection earlier into the life cycle, we can actually demonstrate that we're able to um, perform response or prevention um, at a lower expense than we would have if we hadn't um, detected it at the time that we did. Um, there's some speculation in this because what you're assessing is the amount of money that it would have cost um, if it went into a later stage. So it does take some uh, some speculation in terms of dollar signs with that. But I think loss prevention, and um, again, I have some some formulas around around that to try to calculate it and then get an agreed upon um, sort of sequence. And when you can push detection into an earlier phase and whatever phase model you're using, whether it's attack from MITRE or kill chain from Lockheed Martin, you can say, well, we moved it up the chain for detection and then intervention um, through either automation or through detection and response, and we have just saved a lot of money for the organization. And I think that that's, a, you know, in terms of value of the SOC, uh, I think that's the one um, that you can really start to look at in terms of your uh, total cost of ownership for running the SOC and then the uh, the value that's present in that SOC. Okay, one last question to you, and then I'll sort of move on to our panelists here. You mentioned, uh, let's see, I'll rephrase the question. You said most tools uh, and, and many processes are broken. You need to do some verification. Can you give an example of an area where we should be and how we would do verification in our SOC? Oh, yeah, so definitely. Um, I, I said that the, the tools um, were, bro were broken, and not in all ways, but the tools themselves um, will miss things. So as an example, a trivial example, you have a network intrusion detection system that is uh, that is monitoring. 
um, there's a possibility that it will actually uh, miss something. So verification strategy would be to use what I call retro retroactive analysis. Um, and so I typically do this with new indicators of compromise. We're on some sort of a, a frequency. Let's say it's every two weeks, and I, I would refine that given more time. But every two weeks, you kind of um, take the PCAP that you have and go back against that old PCAP with new IOCs. Um, and so that is the idea of, uh, of verification, is that you're going to use a tool uh, on the same data set um, with either a different set of indicators or a um, you know the same set of indicators with a different tool for the assessment. Um, the other thing that I do and advise and sort of a large scale for this is the idea of threat hunting, um, assuming that our detective alerting driven tools are going to miss some stuff. We then have processes, secondary processes, the double check itself to go back and verify um, that set of data across all the uh, all the data that we've collected to try to look for other signal that's present that our, um, our alerting tools missed in some way. Could have been a drop packet, could have been the use case was wrong, could have been the format of the of the log coming into the sim had changed and the uh, the rule hadn't been adjusted to account for that. So that's generally what I'm talking about is that don't assume that the stuff's working right. Um, have a healthy sense of distrust and approach your uh, approach your SOC in that fashion. Okay, let me move on to our panelists. I'll sort of go in order. They talked. John from Silo had a question. Uh, our our analysts and uh, incident responders believe speed is of the essence, and uh, you know they use local browsers, and they believe performance is real critical. How is going to a cloud-based browser going to get? What kind of performance is that going to give? Yeah. So one one answer is to uh, to let them try it out and see for themselves. Our customers tell us um, they've had great experiences with it. You know, probably the easiest way to understand it is to think of the end-to-end -end path of the traffic. And so when you're going out to our servers, uh, things like the network access, the speed of the server, uh, the rendering, you know, are happening at an order of magnitude faster than they would on a desktop machine. And then all we're sending down to the desktop are the, um, the pixels, the rendered display. So a very little amount of energy that or uh, traffic the data that comes down there. So overall, uh, typically the performance is, is better, and you can see that because the, the bandwidth of our server um, to the network and, and to process things is much, much larger, and that's a, a majority of the time it's taken there. Okay, I'll toss the next one to Chris from Logarithms. Um, we've heard a lot about SOAR, security orchest orchestration, automation, response. Um, but we find we're dealing with a lot of uh, manual correlation we have to do because a lot of the promised sort of automated correlation doesn't work very well. And we have to do a lot of verification as Chris brought out. How is your use of SOAR or integration of SOAR tools dealing with those problems? Sure, I think, you know, one of the things I can say is that um, <clears throat> For dealing with effective correlation, a big part of that actually doesn't have to do with SOAR, more or less. It has to do with how you're collecting the data and then how are you processing, processing the data so that it is primed uh, to be correlated um, effectively um, across all the different security tools as well as the IT infrastructure um, data that you gather in the environment as well as the network data that ExtraHop talked about. And so uh, a big way to uh, a big way to address that is really not by SOAR, but it's actually in the collection and processing of the data that you're collecting. And typically that would be a SEM collecting it. It could be an, another uh, type of security tool in your environment. And so there, my suggestion there is make sure that the tool you select um, does that um, processing in a vendor agnostic way so that correlation can be uh, most effective. And then once that correlation is performed, it's those alerts that are sent up um, to a SOAR platform or embedded within a SOAR capability of the current solution that then um, hopefully will be of higher quality. Okay. We had a question I'll toss to Barbara from 
extra hop. Um, essentially, like everybody else, we're not happy with the quality and completeness of asset discovery. You're talking about using network traffic. We already do vulnerability scanning and sort of network-based identification. How are you getting better data just from the network without using agents or credential-based uh, uh, techniques? Thanks, John. Uh, so our approach is pretty different. Because we're out of band, we actually um, take a, a cap or a span, a port mirror, and we um, observe the traffic, and we do full stream reassembly um, in memory to uh, figure out what's going on on the network. And through that process, we will have decoded you know, more than 50 different protocols for different applications, the whole layer two to seven stack. Uh, and we capture an entire session's worth of information about a transaction. So all that information is reassembled and organized. It's classified um, and characterized. So based on the type of thing, type of communications, type of activity on the network, we're able to automatically uh, diagnose what kind of thing it is. Is it a client? Is it a server? Is it a data store? Is it a data store of sensitive information? And so through that asset discovery and classification process, we're able to detect in real time who's talking on the network and what are they doing? What are they saying and what does it mean? And that kind of clarity comes uh, through observing. We're not, uh, we're not getting in the way of the traffic. We're not slowing it down. We're able to decrypt in real time. And a lot of this capability is possible now, but it's based on really strong innovation um, and a commitment to, uh, to technology that is available now and practical now because of where we are with um, compute resources and things like that. So um, we focus on trying to take the best source of data, which is the wire, the network traffic, um, characterize what's going on, and then use the more than 4,000 different metrics or metadata that we pull from that data to identify uh, security and other concerns that you should do something about. Okay, thanks. I'm going to answer real quickly one that just came in. In the uh, server report, we used the term in the author's opinions quite a bit. And the question was, was there no supporting research in these instances that could be quoted? Um, I worked at Gardner for 14 years before coming to SANS. Believe me, there's no such thing as a survey that doesn't need the author's opinion added. You cannot ask enough questions and you can never get the wording perfect or have enough chance or, or choices available um, to, to not have to have some, some expert opinion and people like Chris have worked in the field for a long time. The opinion of people like Chris is more valuable in, in many cases than just raw data anyway. So in many cases, we tried to fill in the gaps and you always have to do that in a survey. Um, I think we can fit one more question for you, Chris, in before we run out of time here. They liked uh, your, ta your uh, mentioning about the uh, minimizing of risk reduction and moving detection up earlier and earlier. And the question was sort of, are there things you've seen SOCs at various maturity levels that they can actually do to achieve this goal of detecting earlier and, and being able to quantify loss prevention? Yeah, um, so the things that I have seen um, people do is uh, really develop their internal assessment in terms of performance and the, the places to focus are as you're building out um, use cases, well, first of all, have a, an effective process for developing and assessing the performance of the use case. Um, so um, even beyond just having use cases, it's we build it, this is exactly how we build it. Um, and then with the use case, we are actually tracking the effectiveness of a particular use case and then um, measuring that. If you end up having a use case that fires and you spend a lot of time on it and it doesn't provide something of value um, ever, then uh, it's time to, uh, you know, time to fix that. Um, the other thing is, and this is not in a punitive or negative way, but the idea of actually tracking performance of individual analysts um, in order to drive them to get better. And then the last thing is good internal exercises so that in addition to checking the tools that they're finding things, you're checking the analysts to make sure that the judgment call that the analyst is making every single day, all day long, is effectively aligned with the organization's expectations. And just a simple example of that, and I would uh, encourage you to you know, think about this at your place of work. If I gave an analyst five elements of data and asked them, 
from this information, do you think this is an incident that warrants investigation or escalation? And if so, what would the assessed severity be based on the information that you have available right now? And that question is something that I would hope that you have a portfolio of these sorts of, hey, let me, um, let me challenge you a little bit, give you a hard question and see how you perform in response. And organizations that are committed to that sort of exercise, self-training, and then exterior training as well, are the ones that end up being very mature. Okay, with that, I think we're near the end. I'll just say, uh, uh, any of you watching a recorded version of this, or if you didn't get your question or we didn't answer it, you can send it to q at sans.org and somebody will get, a, get you an answer later on. So back over to you, Chris, for any closing remarks. Uh, just to wrap up, I wanted to uh, thank our, uh, our speakers again, our sponsors again, uh, thank those in attendance. Um, it seemed like uh, we had a good number of folks in and a good number of people staying in through, uh, through all the qu question and answer. Um, that's all I have. All right, well, I'll step in here. And thank you so much, Chris, Barbara, John, Chris, and John, for your great presentation. And to Authentic 8, Awake, Cyberbit, DF Labs, ExtraHop, and Logarithm for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. Our schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.